Thank you for tuning into the OSCE Station Web Lectures. Today we'll be discussing how to take a gastrointestinal history. Hopefully, by the end of the session, you will be able to elicit a comprehensive history and distinguish between different diagnoses. There will be some repetition with this video to previous OSCE Station videos, so please feel free to fast forward to the gastro-specific content. Okay, let's start off with the general formula. Every history comprises of these seven sections, not necessarily in this order. So we start off with a clear introduction. This sets the scene of the consultation. Then the doctor must explore why the patients come to see them today, including a relevant systematic review. The doctor will then delve deeper into the patient's past medical history, family and social history to find out a bit more about the patient as a whole. And finally, and arguably the most important, the doctor must ensure that they have iced the patient to find out what the patient seeks from this interaction, taking into consideration the patient holistically. Okay, let's start off with the introduction. A good introduction is key. It sets the tone and the mood for the consultation, putting the patient at ease. A useful mnemonic to remember is WIPER. With every new consultation, you must make sure that you've washed your hands and all your equipment is sterile. Then you must introduce yourself, say your full name and that you're a medical student. It's important to make sure that you've got the correct patient. So you have to ask them for their full name and their date of birth before you begin with the consultation. E is for explanation. Explain the purpose of the interaction and that you want to take a history from them. They must also understand that they can say no and that by saying no, their treatment will not be affected in any way, shape or form. Finally, R is to reposition. You want to make sure you are able to establish a good rapport with the patient to make sure that you and the patient are both comfortable. Let's talk about why the patient's come in today. This is the presented complaint. This is crucial. Here you'll gather lots of information and will help you narrow down your differentials. Let the patient talk. He or she will tell you what's going on. Use open questions and allow the patient time. So start off with questions such as, what can I do for you today? What seems to be the problem? Leave a minute for the patient to talk without interrupting them. Again, a skill that takes a while to develop. If your patient doesn't say that much, prompt them using cues such as, tell me more about that. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Open questions that nudges them to divulge a little bit more information. Once the minute or so is up, you can now intervene and ask questions that you want to ask. Once the minute or so is up, you can now jump in to find out what you want to know. I think Socrates is a great mnemonic to remember when asking about the presented complaint. S is for sight. Find out where exactly the complaint started from. The onset, when it began, and what they were doing when it began. The character, is it intermittent or continuous? Radiation, does it move anywhere? Or is it associated with any other features? Or symptoms. T is for timing. How long does it last for? Does it come on in discrete episodes? Does anything exacerbate the symptom or make it feel better? And finally, assess the severity and find out on a scale of 0 to 10 how bad it is. Obviously, some parts may or may not be relevant, so use this acronym with caution. The best clinicians are able to tailor every history to the patient depending on what they are presenting with. Moving on to a focus history. This is a great way to pick up on symptoms the patient may or may not have been experiencing or don't think is that important or might have just forgotten. So for a GI history, we're going to focus on gastro complaints and symptoms. You may touch on other systems if time permits whilst doing a systematic review. Whenever I'm thinking about a GI, I think about a man again. Find a logical way that works for you. The ones I've highlighted are the ones that I think are important to ask about. So, let's start from the head. Nausea and vomiting. 
When asking about this, always remember to ask about the content of the vomit. For example, the colour, the consistency, how frequent, etc. Dysphagia, does the patient struggle to swallow? Is that with food or with liquids? Abdominal pain is a very common complaint patients tend to have. Don't forget to Socrates this, as there are multiple causes of abdominal pain. Reduced appetite and altered bowel habits are fairly common. One must be careful and always remember to think about malignancy and ask about questions such as fever, malaise, weight loss. In an ideal world, we'd all do a full systems review. However, in 10 minutes, it's not really possible. So again, make sure you have a little man in your head and work through by asking relevant questions for symptoms that they could possibly have and that are applicable to the presented complaint. For example, if a patient comes in with polyuria, that is increased frequency in urination, ask about peripheral sensation changes or visual changes that could lead to a diagnosis of diabetes. Keep an open mind when questioning early on. Here's a reference that you can look back at or pause this video when and as you'd like. So I've got an idea of why the patient's here and what the problem may be. But we need some background information and that's where the past medical history, family and social history all come to play. This not only directs our differentials but also allows us to appreciate the patient as a whole person with needs other than just their symptom relief. Let's start off with their past medical history. Ask if they have any current conditions. I find a good way to ask this is to ask them about what medication they're on, as most of them don't necessarily think they suffer from any conditions as such because their symptoms are relieved. Do they have any GI specific diseases such as IBD or IBS or GORD or any conditions in general like diabetes? Have they been to hospital before? If they have, ask when, was it an emergency or was it a planned surgery? All these questions give us an idea of the patient's health in general and it's important as different conditions interact with each other in different ways. Moving on to a drug history. Ask about medication that's both prescribed, such as NSAIDs and PPIs, and over-the-counter medication. Don't forget to ask about their compliance and if they are using their medication appropriately. This is a good time to ask about any allergies they may suffer from too, such as penicillin, and ask them what happens when they take it. In a GI history, it's important to ask about travel. Have they ingested any uncooked food or dirty water, which they wouldn't normally have? This could suggest something like salmonella poisoning or shigella. Have they been bitten? This could be suggestive of malaria. We move on to family history now. Ask about any general conditions that might run in the family, such as cancer and hypertension. Then move on to GI specific questions, such as IBS, IBD and colon cancer, especially those associated with FAP and HNPCC. Moving on to the social history. A very important part of the history from both a holistic care point of view and it also reveals clues about the patient and how they are coping. Ask about smoking, drinking and recreational drugs. Make sure you quantify exactly how much and how often. With smoking, find out how many cigarettes a day they smoke with alcohol, how many units a week. Patients tend not to know this, so rephrase by referring to glasses of wine or pints of beer. This is important when thinking about liver pathology, for example. When asking about recreational drugs, don't forget to ask about the mode, as IV drug uses are a risk factor for hepatitis. A comprehensive sexual history is also a must. This is to exclude blood-borne viruses such as HIV and hepatitis. It's becoming more and more important to ask about their diet and their exercise. This can reveal things like gluten sensitivity with celiac disease or fatty foods being associated with abdo pain and cholecystitis. Ask your patient to take you through a typical day, each mealtime and snacks. This is a great opportunity for you to advise the patient if you feel like their life isn't optimal. You can tell them how and how they can live a healthier life, giving them points of contact to help them cut down and reach their goal. It's important not to just treat the patient and their presented complaint, but to consider how you can, as a doctor, improve the patient's life as a whole. Find out about how things are at home and if they're getting on okay, and if they need any extra support. Are they coping in general? Do they have a good support network at home? 
and how their conditions affect their day-to-day -day activities. Throughout the consultation, it's important that you ice the patient. Where appropriate, find out what the patient's thoughts are, if they have any worries with regards to their symptoms and what they want to achieve from this consultation. You want to feel like the patient has been listened to and feel that they are satisfied. Summaries are a good way to clarify the information that you have gathered, checking that what you've understood is correct. And it also allows the patient to correct you or expand if need be. Signposting is a great technique to give the consultation direction. Telling the patient what you've just covered and what you intend to cover. I just want to end on a few common presentations and differentials. This is to give you an idea of what to look out for when taking a history. This isn't an exhaustive list, but a few salient ones that you should be able to recognise. Some important upper GI symptoms include hemostasis. Find out about the colour and consistency. Fresh red blood can indicate a malleable vice tear or variceal ruptures, whilst blood that's coffee ground in colour suggests digested blood, which can indicate ulcers. Patients can present with difficulty in swallowing, either due to painful lesions on their mouth or physical restriction. Unintentional weight loss should always be questioned due to malignancy. How much weight have they lost? Has their appetite changed in any way? Is it purposeful? Nausea and vomiting are incredibly common. Go into detail about the characteristics of the symptoms to find out about the frequency and the volume of vomiting. Analyse the content. Is the vomit bilious? Is there undigested food in there? All this will give you clues to what's caused the problem. Patients tend to complain of jaundice, that is, yellowing of the skin, which has multiple causes, from prehepatic, hepatic to posthepatic. Some of the causes include infections, such as hep B, to alcoholic liver disease, to malignancy such as pancreatic cancer. Taking a thorough history will help you distinguish which one is more likely. Bloating is another complaint. I always think of the five F's when thinking about bloating. That is fats, fetus, fetus, fluid and feces. Abdominal pain is a key presentation. Make sure you Socrates the pain. This will help you in distinguishing the many causes that it could be. Getting the location and the nature of the pain is very helpful when narrowing down what could be the cause. Moving on to altered bowel habit. Just like vomiting, it's important to get a good description of the stool and bowel movements. Is there blood or mucus in the stool, which could indicate IBS or IBD, or fissures? Is the stool dark and tar-like, which will suggest bleeding higher up in the GI tract? Or is the stool floaty and pale, which would suggest biliary obstruction? Ask if they're experiencing diarrhoea or constipation. Many patients find talking about this embarrassing and will glaze over it, but it's essential to stress to them the importance of getting a detailed history and that there's nothing to be embarrassed about. As mentioned before, there are several reasons for pain. This slide covers key differentials and what one might expect with each of them. Bowel obstruction presents with vomiting, appendicitis, tends to happen in young patients that have umbilical pain that migrates to the right iliac fossa. Gallstones have a range of causes and can present with jaundice, rigors and pain. Pancreatitis presents with severe epigastric pain that radiates to the back and is often relieved when sitting forward. Diverticular disease tends to present in elderly patients with pyrexia and left iliac fossa pain. Gastritis tends to be an epigastric pain that is associated when eating foods. Although this is a GI history, one mustn't forget of other causes of abdominal pain, such as urological causes, such as renal colic, which is a loin to groin pain. And if the patient's female, one mustn't forget gynecological problems, such as an ectomic pregnancy. Both of these are medical emergencies, and so you must rule them out. We've discussed questions to ask in changing of bowel habits. So let's discuss some findings one could have. IBS patients tend to fluctuate between diarrhea and constipation, as often related to stress. In IBD, the stool tends to be quite bloody and mucousy. Patients with celiac disease tend to have loose fatty stool. Patients that suffer from gastroenteritis experience diarrhea that is often accompanied by vomiting and nausea. Elderly patients can present with colon cancer with melina 
and weight loss. Similarly to pain, it's really important to think of other reasons for change in bowel habits, not just GI causes, such as thyrotoxicosis or hypothyroidism. Rectal bleeding is another common complaint, which has multiple causes, from anal fissures that bleed on defecation, it tends to be bright red on the tissue paper, and patients tend to be fairly constipated. Diverticular hemorrhages is a the sudden painless rectal bleeding that present in elderly patients. Patients with hemorrhoids tend to be fairly constipated and bleed when they defecate. Patients with cancer tend to have alternating bowel habits, weight loss and urgency. Patients with IBD tend to have blood mixed in with their stool and tend to be fairly mucousy. Hemorrhagic infective gastroenteritis is acute diarrhoea with vomiting. One must question what food the patient has ingested. Hemorrhagic peptic ulcer or gastritis. They have gastric symptoms. Risk factors include NSAID use, alcohol and spicy foods. Esophageal varices. This is common in alcoholics and can also present with rectal bleeding. Hematemesis. This is vomiting of blood. Causes could be peptic ulcer hemorrhages. Hemorrhagic gastritis esophageal varices or Mary vice tears, all differentials that one must think about when a patient presents with vomiting of blood. Just to reiterate how important it is to communicate effectively, this truly makes a difference in how your consultation goes. These are eight top tips that you should remember to improve your communication. Use open questions, avoiding multiple or leading questions, Make summaries throughout your consultation and signpost where appropriate. Try to avoid using jargon and ensure you express your empathy throughout the consultation through either your words or your behaviour. This concludes our talk on how to take a GI history. I hope you found it useful and will tune in to the OSCE station soon for more tutorials. Thank you for listening.